We talked a lot today about increasing complexity in systems and software, but the most complex thing we have is the people that are working on that. And most of us have no training in how people work. And I think I should go back and get my psychology degree, and that, that would be the most helpful thing that I could do. Um, over the past years, our companies have gone global, right? And we've learned to understand the cultural differences around the world and the difference between the way the Chinese and the Germans and the Americans are going to work. We have embraced um, diversity and inclusion. And so now we understand the differences between genders and race and other things. And so now when I'm doing a presentation, I can look out across the audience and I can see people nodding their head up and down. And I understand now that for some people that means they agree with me. And for some people that means they understood what I said. And for some people this doesn't even mean yes and for they're just being polite. And now I know that there are differences in what they say. Within our company, we have microcultures between organizations. Their culture is different. Their behaviors are different. And we have cultural differences between disciplines uh, within engineering. So our systems engineers, I'm going to call, they see the force, right? They are the big picture people. They understand how the whole thing works together. And they're going to kind of paint with a broader brush. They're, they're communicating at a higher level. Our software engineers are more like the individual trees in that force. And they understand the, the detail, right? The devil's in the detail. I understand all about my tree. And I might even understand the trees around me. But I don't know any of the other trees that are a long way away in the forest. And I may not even know where I fit into the forest. So I have a very different perception and a view. And what happens is you're taking your systems engineers that have a particular kind of context for the knowledge that they have. And they're trying to flow that down to our software engineers that have a different context and a different perception of that information. So a lot of times there's misunderstanding between that. So we get to what we've been talking about a lot today. I thought maybe I'd be the one that was going to harp on communication, but I think I'm in very good company. But the problem that George Bernard Shaw said is the problem with communication is the illusion that it has been accomplished. <laughs> We all think that we have the same meaning for words. It's like we think we know what shaking our head up and down means. And if I think you may have the same context as I do, I'm, I know you understood me and you know you understood me. And we don't probe. We don't investigate any further to see did we not have understanding. Because we think we have understanding when we don't. And that's the biggest problem that I see. And there's a couple of different ways in there. This when we have the same words, but they mean different things. And there's a lot to be said for active listening and listening with the context that you have. If you are saying something that I largely agree with, chances are I'm not even going to hear the differences in, in what you're saying because I just oh, it's very that, that's what I believe, I understand you, I got you, and I and I'm don't listen for the distinction. If you are saying something that I disagree with, I probably really aren't going to understand and hear what you're saying because I know you're wrong. So why am I going to spend the time? And if you're saying something that's a little bit more ambiguous and doesn't have all the details in it, so as a systems engineer might be, I'm going to fill in those details from my context. And if my context is just my little tree, I'm going to hear things differently than what you meant to say when you're talking from the bigger force perspective. The other thing that I see that happens is we change words. So if we have trouble understanding meaning from the same word, think what happens when we change the word. So as we go from that system perspective down to the software, and they rewrite it in their own words, and they allocate requirements, and we start spreading it around different organizations and different people, we really have lost the, the meaning of what we're talking about. You get a lot of different interpretations. I have a very simple example for you. I want to design a slide with nothing on it. <laughs> So all of you can kind of say, and I, okay, you all know what that means. I want a slide with nothing on it. So here's your task. You guys go off and design a slide with nothing on it. So here it is. But someone might point out that, well, you left this master background on here from the PowerPoint slide. So it doesn't have nothing on it. It's just still got this little border around that. So here's one. It has absolutely nothing on it. Finally, success. But in my industry, if I left this, blank piece of paper in a presentation or a document, someone would delete it. So I have to say, intentionally left blank, right? <laughs> now we know it's supposed to be there. 
But if you were a more literal or perhaps maybe a more creative person, you might actually put the word nothing on the slide. So it's very easy to misinterpret what we're saying. I have this quote from Robert McCluskey. I know that you believe you understand what you think I said, but I'm not sure you realize that what you heard is not what I meant. And even trying to understand what this says, this is the world that we all live in. And the trick, I think, between systems engineering and software engineering is that instead of assuming you have understanding, is that you have to ensure that you have understanding. And that means you have to follow your instructions from that system level down to the software. You have to see how they interpret it. You have to see how they implemented it. You have to check it, which means you have to have constant interaction with each other in order to get true communication. I decided in, in talking about making some remarks, what I wanted to do was start with something we agreed upon. And um, I was surprised that, to see that Art had done a similar thing. Cheryl will certify that she got these slides at 10 o'clock last night. So I didn't copy from, from Art this morning. But I also formed a word cloud from the 18 or 19 position papers that we created. And I honestly thought something might emerge from this that I could use in my remarks. And after staring at this for some time, I concluded that we all agree that this workshop is about systems and software engineering has something to do with engineers and systems. Beyond that, this made me think of what a word cloud from the Tower of Babel might have looked like had we had such. So I thought maybe it might be more productive to start with some questions. And I want to preface the first with an assertion. I believe, and from reading the position papers, I believe I'm not alone in my belief that the widespread use of software fundamentally changes the nature of systems. There's something different about the systems we build today than there was about the systems that many of us cut our teeth on. And it's fundamental and it's significant. My questions are, why is that so and how is it changed? I have a second assertion, which is the coupling, the tight coupling, between software and the physical world significantly changes the nature of software. And my questions about that are the same as my questions about the first. Why and how? Now, when I have conversations with people about these two assertions and their associated questions, I frequently find that people are very clear about the answers to one or the other of these questions, but not both. And so to the quote that Linda put up, right, it's we need to be able to answer these questions not to those who come from the same background as us, but to others. In the case of uh, systems engineers trying to understand the answer to the first question, those of you with long experience in software have to be able to, under to explain it so that I can understand it. And Looking at some of the comments, and I, and I think that uh, uh, both uh, Koshik and Barry in his first paper did a wonderful job of presenting some of the cultural and uh, historical differences between systems engineers and software engineers. For, for us systems engineers, we have to be able to explain the answers to, to these questions to people who perhaps haven't taken physics or chemistry, and maybe not, you know, six or eight courses in continuous mathematics, but have a different background. 
My last assertion is that understanding the answers to these questions is essential if we're going to be able to better engineer the cyber-physical systems that we've been discussing this morning and that are present in those papers. The two people that I have in my network who I think do this very well have an interesting and complementary background. One is an experienced and trained software engineer with a computer science degree who did his PhD in systems engineering. The other is a trained and experienced systems engineer who did her PhD in computer science. Now, I don't believe that we're each going to have to get PhDs in each, in each other's domains, but I do think we're going to have to understand the different mental models through which we view the world. And I provided an example of that in my position paper. I think we're going to have to learn each other's language, not simply uh, try to make assertions in our own. I think we have to take responsibility for translating what we know into the language of those we need to talk to. And I didn't add this, Jeff, after your talk, but I think this is going to require active listening. I'm reminded often when I hear systems engineers and software engineers try to explain their perspective to their opposite number of um, stories my brother-in-law tells. My brother-in-law grew up in a Spanish-speaking household and talks about some of his early experiences in school when he was learning English as a second language. And he said so many times he wanted to say to people, I'm not deaf, I just don't understand English. I hope we have an opportunity to explore these thoughts more as we go forward, thanks. I think what Jeff and Bill went through was very representative of what I've seen um, over time. And I think I can take that and then lead into the next panel, which is on education, because I wanna talk about are we preparing people to deal with systems um, and, and creating the competencies and skills that they need uh, in this day and age to deal with systems. And by systems, I mean systems. I don't mean systems engineering or anything like that. Um, you know, in systems engineering, in software engineering, there's software systems engineering. In mechanical engineering, there's mechanical systems engineering. So there's a disciplinary aspect and then there's a systems aspect. So I would agree with the focus that Maybe software engineering and system engineering aren't that much different when one looks at the system aspects of what people do. Um, and But there are differences in the discipline that have to be addressed. So I would call the systems aspects being the integrative discipline of bringing all these things together where mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, software engineering, those things are the skill bases that one learns in the process. So I would just offer up three observations um, along this question. Um, and one of those observations up front, Bill mentioned, is, is dealing with unstructure. So, you know, one of the things when you get into these integrated disciplines is you get a whole lot more unstructured problems or situations that you have to deal with. And are we adequately preparing people in, in their core disciplines to deal with lack of structure and turn structure? lack of structure into structure, which is abstraction. Um, a lot of the disciplines that we do deal with in system engineering today, which would be mechanical engineering and you know physics-based things, have, their, their training is quite a bit about structure. Um, and we're training them out of the ability to do on structure. On the other hand, you know, if I'm 15 years old and I'm experimenting with software, on the internet, I'm living in unstructure. You know, it's almost an art at that point in time. And, and so, because software is in itself abstract, um, software engineers or software people tend to be a little bit more prepared today to deal with the type of unstructured problems that we see because they live in that space quite a bit. So that's just a comment on how people view in terms of education. Um, we need to look at not just system engineering process, but we need to look at how things get unstructured, get structured. Um, the second observation I'll make has to do with 
this emerging discipline that actually emerged a long time ago called information sciences. So um, I have noticed in teaching in our master's program in systems engineering that when you start getting to these integrative concepts um, that we end up finding a, a lack of skill in some areas in people that have had hardware backgrounds um, versus people that have software backgrounds. Um, and it's a core skill. Um, and it's really around the whole science of information. <laughs> um, so, um, so the second observation here is that there's a couple of key things in information science, um, like how information is stored, managed, and retrieved, what we used to call library sciences, um, that has to do with object orientation versus physical orientation of these systems that we work in. Um, we don't want to take people that were mechanical engineers and train them how to write code or do software engineering, but we do need to train them how information is organized and managed. And the other side of that is the cognitive sciences, so how information is interpreted. So there's two key kind of disciplines there that computer science teaches, um, but generally need to be placed on systems engineers. That when the education people get up, they ought to maybe address that a little bit. Um, the third piece of this, and as an integrative discipline, so when I think of what is the other kinds of really integrative disciplines, you know, um, business management comes into mind quite a bit in that space. And, and so I think levels of training need to be addressed. Um, you can take teach basic systems concepts as a discipline, um, and you can create individual contributors in the system engineering field to do requirements derivation and all these kind of things, at some point in time, um, this role of lead systems engineer comes along. And lead systems engineer takes on a role that's like a functional or product management role takes on. Um, and so we don't necessarily go back and train people to get an MBA when they take on those roles in system engineering, but we ought to think of professional education in systems engineering to be like an MBA. We need to prepare those um, people for that level of discipline. And then when you get up the chain, like to the point where you're dealing as a system architect or something, this is really where we take people and we put them through executive training in the business management world. And, and so we really need to think about structuring how we do systems engineering as not a skill base where you look at training people in process, but more where we look at developing people the different levels of understanding, very much like the way we do business management in that space. And so we've kind of taken that tack at Georgia Tech where our, our master's degree in system engineering is like an MBA of system engineering. And then we have a long time been offering executive level training in systems to different people because you'd be surprised how many people need that at that level. So that's my comment. Time for questions. I'm gonna throw out the first question. Um, this morning, through all of our speakers, and each of you mentioned the um, the trade the handoffs between systems engineering and software engineering information and knowledge, and uh, how often uh, information gets lost in translation. The translation gets lost, and then um, the software engineers may not have the right material in order to develop the software the way the systems engineers intended. Can you tell us about your experiences or your thought process of utilizing software engineers on the systems engineering team during the systems engineering task and then and then transitioning those software engineers into the software development teams as the software gets developed? Do you have experience in that or thoughts on that process? Does it work? Does it not? Me first. So I guess out of my experience space, I've never been in a situation where we didn't have software engineers on the system engineering teams. Um, so that's, I guess, kind of been a luxury. Um, a couple points. Um, if you're doing system engineering, again, I'll mention this unstructured. Up, up in the front of the program where things are not well structured, you need face-to-face -face interaction between all the disciplines to drive how it's going to be structured. And once you've got the process and structure defined, then people can go follow their disciplines in, in the area. Um, and so I kind of found that out is that you need to have that strong interdisciplinary dialogue happen 
really, really upfront and then maybe on as it goes on. The other thing I'll say, and this is just a comment that I've seen, um, when we started the F-22 program at Lockheed back in the late 1980s, we used integrated product development and we took it to an extreme, I think, that nobody else will ever take it to again. Um, in that fact, but we had a, a system engineering group that we called analysis and integration. The concept was they would be the analysis team and then they would go into the product teams and then they'd come back out in the end. Somewhere along the lines, we created this concept of a system engineering and integration team. I see it. That was a separate organizational structure than what was intended in this whole process. And I've actually seen that happen on programs over time where system engineering has become a stovepipe discipline. It's an integrative discipline. You know, we need to make sure that we look at how those skills come together, disperse, and then come back together in the end. I'll make a couple of comments about the question. Um, first, let me make a distinction um, because uh, I think I think we need to think in terms of the software engineers that there probably are a whole range of software engineers. Um, I believe that there is a lot of uh, software engineering that can go on by software engineers at the component level, just like there's a lot of mechanical engineering and electrical engineering that can go on at that level where the component, a component of the system has been sufficiently isolated, separated from the rest of the system that that those people can can do that. And I'm not really talking about that level of software engineer. But if my first assertion is correct that the prevalence of software in cyber physical systems fundamentally changes the, num na the, the nature of systems. And if, in fact, um, the, because of the history and experience of many of our systems engineers, they don't understand that the questions why and how, then that expertise needs to be there from the very beginning. And so some people who understand software engineering have to be part of that team. Ultimately, I think it was suggested in one of the position papers that um, uh, what really needs to emerge is something called a cyber physical systems engineer, uh, a clone or a hybrid that would actually have a range of skills across all of this. And I think, I think that's a great idea. I suspect when that happens, they may end up being called systems engineers. Um, I often point out that we spend a lot of time trying to determine what should we call these software intensive systems, software enabled systems, cyber physical systems or whatever. And what we really need is a retronym to describe systems that weren't dependence on software because I think they're becoming relics, you know. So just like we, we we know the distinction between a digital watch and an analog watch or one that I like with kids in my classes is a, a day baseball game from a night baseball game and they all go, they used to play baseball in the daytime. Um, uh, the fact is that I think that, I think that the, the class of systems, interesting systems that aren't significantly dependent on software is a vanishingly small set. Well, I would say that most of our systems engineers are grown, not um, bought, so to speak. Um, our systems engineers came through the ranks of software or mechanical or electrical, and with experience, um, they became systems engineers. And so we do hire a few new grad systems engineers, but, but mostly they're experienced. And so, on our systems engineering teams, we will have people with software background. Um, us as well have, though, most of our systems engineers are electrical and mechanical engineers, and I think they kind of grow up having to interface with a lot of different people. That's part of the, their job. Um, they don't work in isolation, so they, they tend to, to do that job better. I think where it works and where it doesn't work. Um, at our company, we do what we call the small black boxes. Here's a communications radio. It's a relatively small system by itself. And we also do large systems. So here's an entire cockpit. When we had a smaller development, the team is much more naturally integrated, and there's a lot more shared accountability. And I think the trick isn't just that you have software-knowledgeable people on your systems team. It's that the 
People with systems responsibility also have shared accountability for how it ultimately gets implemented in the software. And on our smaller projects, that happens naturally because they're smaller teams. On the larger systems, it doesn't happen so well because you've got 100 systems engineers and 200 software engineers or whatever it is. And that shared accountability doesn't happen. The handoff tends to be much more of an abrupt throw it over the wall. Here it is. And so I think the trick to all of this is where you can keep an integrated team that truly has shared responsibility and accountability, then it works far better than when we don't do that. Some uh, questions from the from the crowd. I'll start with you. Yeah. Thanks. So uh, I think a kind of traditional view is that uh, that the systems engineers have the whole system perspective and essentially then allocate tasks out to software engineers. But when 85 or 90 percent of the functionality of a complex system is in software, you know, I I think I agree uh, with the proposition that it changes the nature of, of systems. And it probably changes that relationship as well um, uh, uh, in the sense that, you know, you've got to have people who understand computational phenomena and uh, the issues that arise and the opportunities that computation creates for uh, new kinds of systems. Um, and so, uh, you know, one might hypothesize that you actually see a kind of an inversion where, you know, people who are expert in software become essentially those who are responsible for the predominant part of system conception. And so the question is, um, if the, you know, what we're sort of calling the software engineers become elevated to uh, what has traditionally been a kind of systems engineering level of responsibility, then what from traditional systems engineering don't your typical software engineers understand that would allow them to carry out that computational systems engineering task effectively. From my standpoint, if you're willing to answer no to my second assertion, then you're in good shape. My second assertion was that tight coupling between the software and the physical world significantly changes the nature of software. And so unless the software engineers you're speaking about have the depth of knowledge and experience in physical phenomena in the physical world, I think you're going to just trade one problem for another. I think that both are required, but um, I believe the answer to both my first two assertions is yes. What I find is that there they may be missing some things fundamentally from their historical uh, experiences, but what develops the system is the teamwork. And what the software engineers would need to know in this manner is to, to know what they don't know and ask the questions and make sure that they're not making these decisions in a vacuum and work more as an integrated team than making the decisions by themselves. So my question is, is um, I didn't hear anybody kind of touch on an issue that I thought might come up here, which is, do you believe there are inherent personality differences as a as a general rule, not as a not as obviously in a specific case, but as as a general rule between systems and software engineers that fundamentally get in the way of their ability to actually communicate well and and work well together? Um, and I might use a few examples like the normal, you know. As a general rule, I would say systems engineers might tend to be more extroverted. They can, they they work well in groups in general. So software engineers maybe are more introverted. Um, I noticed that systems engineers um, don't have any trouble with estimating. In fact, they oftentimes do it with no, little or no basis. Um, <laughs> software software engineers, for example, hate to estimate and oftentimes refuse to. So it, there's not maybe something telling about the personality differences that might exist between systems and software engineers that might come into play here. And I was wondering if anybody had any comments on that. So I'll just add back to kind of the structure versus unstructured that, you know, there's this, this, there's this ability to see things that are observable and ability to see things that are not observable or abstract. And so some people are more adept at one or the others. If, if I take in my class, I usually, 
take a system, group of systems engineers, and I have them take a system and draw a picture of it 50 years in the future. You know, people that deal with observable, real hardware and things a lot have a very difficult time drawing a picture of a system in the future, whereas people that deal with abstract contract concepts don't have so hard of a time. So it's interesting to watch it happen. So I think that's one inherent thing is that, you know, it's not you can generalize on it that way, but I think it's one inherent thing that's out there. My own experience in hiring and working with systems engineers over 30 years in industry is that um, systems engineers come in a wide distribution. In fact, what I tried to do was hire across a wide distribution. So I've met systems engineers, I've worked with systems engineers, but the last thing I would want them to be doing is thinking about what the system's going to look like in 50 years. Um, uh, they, they look much more like uh, the caricature of traditional engineers or some of the caricatures, caricatures I've read in the position papers about uh, software engineers than they do like the kind of people that uh, I think you're talking about, Mike. Um, uh, I think that there are people in this room just listening this morning who have a software engineering background, probably consider themselves software engineers that I would be delighted to have on my systems engineering team or even work on theirs. And um, so I suspect there's a range. Perhaps the, the medians of these distributions are in different places. I, I don't know, but uh, I think that um, people in the end are individuals and what you're trying to look for is you're trying to look for certain skills and capabilities kind of independent of training and job title. Uh, yeah, I, I see the uh, better multitasking with poorer attention span. <laughs> In uh, that's something I've been I've been looking at because I'm, I'm looking at the future of of organizations and how we need to prepare for the future and what is the future of engineering going to be like. In the aerospace industry, it's, it's becoming increasingly harder. To, to get entry level employees that want to go into traditional old fashioned types of processes. And that's what they look at when they see the aerospace industry. Um, so we need to adapt on the way that we develop systems. This virtual model is going to be the way we go in the future, whether we hang on or not. I see people becoming more individual contributors versus versus part of, of a company or an organization or a department. Be looking for people's uh, skills. You'll be looking, you'll be staffing your people based on their skills, not, not, on their, not on what organization they're in or which company they came from, but what they've performed in life. And we'll, be work, we'll definitely be working with virtual teams. We do that today. We do that in a lot of on a lot of programs. We do it in the open source community. People don't see each other in the open source community, but they create great products. And I see us creating systems like that in the, in the future. So I've got, I've got a... Oh. I can add to that. I mean, I think we're certainly headed the same way of um, the global development happening as well. Our teams are very much disconnected, and as people learn how to how to do that, we're much more open to bringing in these folks from from different um, organizations and that don't sit with us. But I tell you, we still discover that the teams that are co-located and work together and know each other well are the ones that perform the best. So the challenge for all of us is to figure out how do you get that team engagement across people that are distributed against different time zones and, and different geographies. And some of our folks have done that pay attention to that do it very well. But but it takes it's a whole new skill that we have to develop to learn how to how to do that. And our engineers that come in, I tell you these the youngsters, they're fast, they're quick, they're bright, they're creative. Um, they want to learn from the experienced people that are there. And um, I'm always amazed at, at how much they can 
get done given enough and uh, sufficient direction and coaching from the people that are the subject matter experts. And the two combined is very powerful. If I can take a 30-year veteran with deep knowledge about the products we're making and hook them up with a group of very um, talented, young, innovative people, that's, that's where we get the most creative, powerful team. I, wanna, I, I was going to make a question, but before I've got to make a comment about the open source distributed model. Um, I've spent uh, some years um, unhappily um, collaborating with uh, some colleagues who are social psychologists, and it was unhappy because the facts that I learned about humans, particularly humans working on committees, you could say teams, but if that, that, that's an outcome if you can get it, <laughs> uh, are, are generally kind of gloomy. Um, and so one of the things I learned is uh, if they've actually done studies uh, for some of the successful open source projects, for example, the Apache web server. And what they found is that there's a very uneven distribution of, of contributions from the developers. And if, you know, like a decade ago, there were about 400 developers working on Apache, but uh, five of them accounted for half of the code and a dozen of them counted for about 80% of the code. And so, and those people work very closely together and they know each other. So the idea of sort of starting out of the gate and working successfully in a really deep way at a distance, that's not happening. And the other thing that social psychologists say is when they're giving advice, so for example, I've got a colleague, Jim Herbslev, who's been studying Conway's Law, the reality of Conway's Law. And the advice he always gives to firms uh, is front load travel, right? Get people together, drink beer, yell at each other, develop trust, whatever it takes. And then when they work at a distance, it's going to work out and they can, they can actually disagree with each other at a distance because the problem at a distance is everybody's friendly. And, and so it's hard to hard to be ornery or, 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 or contradicting things. So that's just a comment. But what I want to ask you about is, is this active listening idea, which I think is very important. You know, when we teach uh, requirements engineering, we show pictures of people like Claude Levi-Strauss and Margaret Mead, who are ethnographers, right? Uh, anthropologists who you think of as going into the Amazon jungle or to the highlands of Papua New Guinea to try to understand these cultures uh, and to develop that understanding in spite of an enormous gap and distance between the culture of the observer and the culture of the observed. And so there's a sort of weird applied hermeneutics thing going on. And I just um, wanted to get thoughts from you guys about what's the right way to engage with stakeholders during this unavoidably uh, messy business of transit, transiting from informal to sort of more formal models uh, that goes on during requirements uh, elicitation, but also during, you know, T&E and, and all the validity checking and, and the whole feedback loop that goes on. Do you have thoughts on what kind of skills you want to advance in the people who are involved in those activities? One of the things I think we need to take a look at is um, people uh, often don't remember facts when we put as engineers, we, we, we love our data. We put it up in our spreadsheets and we put the spreadsheets on the, up on the charts and we expect everybody to read them and get upset when they don't remember what we put up there. But what people remember are stories. And as we go through society, uh, a lot of learning that takes place across the world is through stories, through narratives, through talking to each other, through explaining and remembering something via, via narratives. Um, I don't know exactly how we'll get to that point, but I think that that's going to play a key role into how to transition between these knowledge bases. I, I would agree with that. I, I think this how do you encourage collaboration is, is the key. I mean, a lot of the work we've been doing is how do we do multi-attribute analysis in, in virtual and trade space environments where people are collaborating with their ideas and um, a lot of the, the work that we've started on now is is really if you go back to the system sciences how do you bridge the soft systems methods qualitative with the hard systems methods and how do you do it formally it's a semantics issue comes up again can we actually create tools that bridge those two types of thought processes so you can take stakeholders into a collaborative setting have active dialogue and listening and then not take the output of that as a document that goes on a shelf and never gets looked at by the hard practitioners. It, it actually drives the semantics of the problem. 
from there on out and they, and they interact with that as they go on. So I think you'll see maybe some evolution in that. But again, you got to get, every time that we bring a customer in this process, they don't want to come have a workshop. And by the third workshop, they've got the religion, right? <laughs> you know, this is really helping. So, you know, that, I think you've got to get to that point. Yeah, the only thing I, I wanted to say in response to that is that um, if you if you watch, if I watch my own behavior, if I monitor how much of the time I'm speaking and how much of the time I'm listening, I sometimes catch myself. And also, particularly in given the pace we're trying to work at, taking time to paraphrase what I heard or maybe taking time to allow or require the person to whom I'm speaking to paraphrase what he or she heard um, seems to waste time. After all, I just said it. And so why would I want someone to take the time to say it back? But I think that's where some of these disconnects can be trapped early. So I, I don't know, you know whether it almost seems trivial, Bill. Um, and yet, and yet I, I, I watch it all the time um, uh, be violated and cause the kinds of impacts we're talking about here. I had one simple thought for you. When you look at a lot of the bias studies, whether it's growth mindset or all these kinds of different biases that happen when you look at um, diversity issues, there's a, something I read that said knowledge of the bias reduces the effect by 70%. Just knowing that someone may not understand what I'm saying, if we could just educate everyone to just have that awareness, that'll probably solve a lot of this problem. And so just it's in starting in the universities, just educating them that realize that what you said, a lot of people don't really understand what you just said. And so take that effort to, to, to parrot it back to them and understand what they said. So knowledge is the where we start. Quick follow up. How do you get how do you get your customers to say they don't know? Rather than make them So I was gonna make a point and I I've been going through a fairly interesting process right now with an incubator called Flashpoint at Georgia Tech and it's a four month intensive startup incubator. Um and Basically, what they do is they take people with their preconceived notions of their products, and then they go through a four-month intensive criticism phase where all of their biases are removed, and they come out the other end with what's probably the most viable path to success for their product. And so we're kind of looking at how you take that into settings like we would do in policy, for instance, from my point of view. How can I take policymakers through an intense four-month process? to quit arguing about things and get through their biases and come out with a few effective things that you might put in place. So I would agree with that. It's this bias removal process. But it's also when you're looking at big system type impacts, you've got to get the dialogue together and active not just once but continually until you at least understand how you're going to define the outcome. Yeah. I think we, we've reached the end of our time schedule here, and Art, Art's going to pull me off the stage if we don't close down. So I, we can uh, talk about this more over lunch. We could definitely talk throughout the rest of the afternoon. But please join me in thanking our panel members for today.